everybody. We're going to get started. Good evening. Is it raining outside already? It looked like it, like all of a sudden a tornado was going to come through. Me. <laughs> well, I just want to thank all of you for um, taking the time to come be a part of this weekend with us. We are so excited that Paul is here. Um, he's been coming. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Heather Corrales. That is my husband, Ray, over there. Corrales, <laughs> standing up. Um, and then Josie, I don't know, Josie Jimenez um, has been, we, so we just, basically this was just on our heart and we wanted to, to bring Paul. Um, there, we've been helping run a discipleship school for about 18 years. And um, Paul was the only teacher that we had come every single year. We had several speakers that would come, but he's the one who came every single year um, for a lot of reasons, which you'll discover as we're doing this. But um, Tim and June Ainley were the directors of that school, and they had both heard Paul um, in previous DTSs, and this message was foundational in their life. And so when we started the school, instantly it was a given that Paul is going to be coming, like he's going to be a part of this with us. So we're super honored and thankful, Paul, that you came. And um, and I do know, just so you know, you know, we're going to be here through Saturday night. Um, I ha- we, there's several people that are going to be joining us tomorrow and on Saturday. There's some different people couldn't get their whole schedules cleared, so there'll be some new faces coming in and joining us as well. We have people coming from out of state and flying, well, f- someone flying from out of state and out of town, people and all sorts of things. So we're excited, but thank you for joining us. Um, so the restrooms, if you don't know, are on the other side of this, this drop cloth. There's restrooms there. There's water and coffee and tea inside the kitchen. And... Um, yeah, we're just gonna let we're just gonna let Paul have the evening. So, Father, I just want to thank you for each person that's here. Thank you for this space. Thank you that we have the opportunity to have Paul with us. It is such an honor to have him here, and we're so grateful. Thank you for the truth that he carries. Thank you, um, Holy Spirit, that you are alive in him, and that we get to hear truth tonight, and we get to know you more as we hear about you. And so, Father, I just pray that you would continue to bring people here safely, people that are sick that have been wanting to come, just with the text of me, and God, I just ask for healing over people that are feeling sick and kids are getting sick, and just bring healing to those homes that that everyone could be here that you want to have here this weekend. And we pray that you would bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I've got to see how long my leash is. I'm uh, very happy to be with you. I thought last year, when I was here, it would be the last time that I came. And so we had this unexpected invitation, which is about the time of year that I normally come. Um, I grew up in Ventura. My first visit to Visalia was December 1970, when I came up here uh, to bring a friend who was from here who became our church secretary. And I came up here to get her stuff, take it back down to Ventura. So that's my first visit to Visalia. And now we've been coming now for 20, I think we decided it's 20, no, 32 years that we've been coming to Visalia. And, uh, and then for the last 18 years every year for the school of discipleship that's been running here in town. <clears throat> I am a teacher of, I was a teacher of chemistry and mathematics. Now, some of you aren't sure that you like me. (laughs) And in 1971, my wife and I sold my home, our home, quit my job, and we joined Youth with a Mission. At that time, it was considered one of God's best kept secrets because hardly anybody ever heard about it. They had one training center that ran one three-month school once a year. Now, only God knows how many there are. It's, we have 20,000 full-time missionaries from 200 countries. Our university functions in 70 nations of the world. We run courses in 110 languages, literally all over the world. And um, <clears throat> when I took my training in Switzerland in December 1971 through, Jan- through uh, April of 72, uh, my teachers kept talking about the character of God this and the character of God that. And I thought, so why do they think this is so important? Is that all they're going to talk about? 
But then I thought to myself, if I look at their lives, it's really clear they know something I don't know. So I decided to do it. Which meant I deliberately and consciously ran after the knowledge of God. As a, as a professional educator, I know how I learn. That's the only way I can help other people learn. And I took the teaching that I'd received and I began to digest it until I could verbalize it to myself. And suddenly one day I went, oh, I see it. I get it. I understand. And I had to stop talking about God since. That was probably 1972. And so this teaching, which I do a lot all over the world, uh, anywhere from a week to two weeks, I think I can talk for about God for three weeks now. And that's not a joke. Um, because there's so much to understand and know about God. Now from the very beginning, because sometimes I will challenge you to fasten your seatbelt. Because I may challenge some of your preconceived ideas. But from the very beginning, I want you to know my job is not to get you to agree with what I believe. That's not my job. My job is to challenge your thinking about what you believe about God and ask you, does what you believe about God draw you into intimacy, relation, intimate relationship with Him or cause you to distance yourself from Him? See, many, many believers have wrong ideas about God. And in prayer, for example, if you have a wrong idea about God in prayer, you become a beggar or a manipulator because you're not sure God can be trusted. So you try to convince God to give you what you think he's reluctant to give you. Or you try to wear him down by begging him until he gives you what you want. And we're not to be beggars or manipulators. Because God can be trusted. What does the scripture say? There's not even a shadow when he turns. So there's no darkness in him. Now, this PowerPoint presentation, you will not be able to write out everything It's so good. But we will leave on Saturday. We will give you a Dropbox link and you'll be able to access this PowerPoint on the internet so that you can fill in your notes. And of course, that means if you're good enough on the internet, you can probably download it and you'd have a permanent record of it. Um, so we're going to talk about God all weekend. God never minds that we talk about him because you can't talk about him. In fact, the moment we talk about it, uh, I grew up with a mother who should have been an English teacher. She read a dictionary for pleasure. If you imagine. We played lots of word games in my family growing up. Words are important to me. Words communicate ideas, and ideas have consequences. And so you and I use all kinds of words that we think everybody understands, but we don't. We use them because we've heard other people use them. Uh, and I'm going to challenge you with some of those things. You know, it's like we all, ever since you've been a believer in church, you've learned and you've read in the scriptures that were made in God's image. So ask yourself, what does that mean? Whenever I ask that question of classes all over the world, I get the same blank stare that some of you are giving me now. Now, by the way, I should tell you, because I am a professional educator, but also teacher by gifting, there are two kinds of people in a group like this. If the teacher asks a question, there's people that stare at you, thinking, if I stare at him, he won't call on me because he'll think I know the answer. <laughs> And the other person, person that won't look at you at all for fear that you will call on them. So you can decide which person you are. <laughs> they didn't call me Hawkeye for no reason, okay? And that's been my nickname for years because Hawkins doesn't miss much. And he sees it. So um, would you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, please? Or open your phone, whichever you prefer. In the book of Ephesians, St. Paul has recorded two apostolic prayers. The first one is recorded in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 17. 
where he prays that the church at Ephesus would, Ephesus would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Did you catch the phraseology there? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. What this teaches us, among other things, is that the knowledge of God does not come by the intellect, but by revelation of the spirit. See, that's what happened to me. My teachers kept talking about who God is, and I thought, why do they think this is so important? And I didn't understand it. But when I began to consciously and willfully run after that knowledge, and by the way, we're going to explain to you what the word knowledge means biblically uh, a little later on, then suddenly one day a revelation came, and I saw it. And I'm still learning. This teaching was two hours when I first begin to teach it. But no matter how much you know about God, there's that much more to know. So the more you know, the more you find out you don't know. So it's... See, I was born again in, as a ten-year-old in a Baptist church. My mother came from a very old-fashioned, staunch Methodist family back in Indiana. And but my grandmother was called to be a missionary when she was 12 years old, but her mother forbid her. So in rebellion to her mother, she turned and married a non-believer, had seven children, who then, after seven children, her husband ran, my grandfather ran off with another woman. And, and so the family was devastated. There were seven kids. My mother was the sixth of seven, and the family was devastated. So there were hardly any believers in my mother's generation um, until my mother's older sister came to Christ and then brought us to Christ. And in 1955, they built a Pentecostal church right next to my parents' home. While they built the building, they um, met in a tent and they put it up on their property and I read next to my parents' bedroom, which was not smart. And my parents used to call the sheriff on them because in the 50s, you know, we called them holy rollers. And we would walk by there and just imagine that they were rolling on the floor. But they built the sanctuary, and I said to my mother, because um, we'd become friendly with the pastor and his wife, even though we mocked as we drove, walked by the back of the property sometimes, although my grandparents' property, which bordered the church property. I said, let's go see the sanctuary. We walked in and I said, okay. Why is it so warm in here when our church is cold no matter what the temperature is? I'm a 15-year-old kid. And she says, I don't know, but we'll find out. And we were Baptists who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we were told that that was opening a horizon to, to, a, a, to unending things. But it, when I looked around, it seemed like once that happened to people, it was the last thing that ever happened to them. And that when they, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, quote unquote, that then they had arrived. And then God brought us to you for the mission in 1971, and that's when the horizon that had no boundaries opened up to us, because the that horizon that was open to us was about knowing God, learning to walk in an ongoing, deepening growing intimate relationship with Jesus, a relationship based on regular, consistent two-way communication, where you speak to him and he speaks to you. And that horizon has never, ever had its boundaries for us since 1971. So that's part of what we want to amplify to you over our weekend together is the possibilities and the excitement we have been Euclidean Mission missionaries for 47 years. If you don't know YWAM, it's a non-salaried mission. It's called a faith mission in certain circles. Nobody, nobody receives a salary of our 20,000 full-time missionaries. And I don't have to turn sideways for you to tell that I'm not starving to death. <laughs> and, and we have raised two sons. We haven't had a paycheck for 47 years. And we have proven God over and over. 
By the time my sons were 18, we never had any money, by the way, but by the time my sons were 18, they'd been to 40 nations each. So when we joined you with the mission, my father said, how can you give up, he wasn't a believer, he said, how can you give up everything you've achieved in only four years of marriage when it took me 25 years to achieve the same thing? I said, well, I guess because it only took four years. And it took my parents almost 20 years to reconcile it to our lifestyle. My mother used to say to me, are you going to live hand to mouth all your life? I go, yeah, well, I teach this stuff. But all it has done is proven that everything God says about himself is true. And if you would ask us, how have you survived 47 years as a non-salaried Wyoming missionary, never burned out, never needed a sabbatical, I mean, I'm still going, I'm 78 years old and I'm still flying over 100,000 miles a year. And I intend to do that probably till I'm 90. Because I can do what I do from a wheelchair and a hospital bed, talk. Why not? I have a good genetic gene pool in my body. We live, we're, we come from a long family of long livers. <laughs> You can take it any way you want, I guess. <laughs> and if you ask us, how have you survived all these years and many years living on next to nothing, we would tell you two things. The growing revelation that God is absolutely everything that he says he is. And number two, developing the skill to recognize his voice so that we always knew what to do when we didn't know what to do. Do you know what to do when you don't know what to do? Well, you talk to Jesus, and he tells you, which means you always know what to do when you do not. That's security. We've never been in a position where we didn't know what to do when we didn't know what to do in any situation over all these almost 50 years. So that's the foundation that we want to lay for you on this weekend or add to what is already in your foundation and believe that there will be a new spark in your heart if you need a little bit of kick in the you-know-what to grow in your relationship with Jesus or, or, or hopefully also be confirming things that he's already teaching you, things that you know down in here and so that you get set free to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Do you know that in Matthew 6, 33, when God commands us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, he is obligated to set us free so that we can seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. For years, my wife had on our refrigerator, I am so grateful God's provision for us is not dependent upon the world's economic system. We've already learned how to live on nothing. So if the economy collapses, we'll just keep doing what we've been doing all these years. See, that's freedom. That's being set free. And that is what God's intention is for every one of his children. Not just the pride who have been a missionary for 47 years. That's what's available for all of us. But... I was a school teacher. I have a master's degree in secondary education. I even have an honorary doctorate degree for what I've done in education and mission for Southern California Seminary, okay? But when I joined you for the mission, I'd been a Christian for 21 years, and I taught Sunday school for 16 of that 21 years. And I only opened my Bible on Saturday night to prepare the lesson we teach on Sunday. I never read the Bible. I didn't understand a word of it. I had... Seven years of university, but I understand the word of the Bible. And I remember one prayer time alone in my bedroom in 21 years. And I never had a quiet time, ever. I never even feel guilty that I didn't. Of course, you can probably figure out there was a lot of pride in my heart. It's called living independent of God. Because your heart said, you don't need God to be a good Christian. You can do it yourself. Well, that was what was going on down here. Not here. That would have been appalling. But it was what was going on here what was taking place. And when we came to give with a mission, their motto is to know God and make him known. And the first thing I discovered was that 
a quiet time was in the daily schedule. So I thought I'd better do it. And my life changed. And then we had a teaching called How to Recognize God's Voice. I thought, you mean he talks? I had no idea. <laughs> well, if I'd been reading the Bible, I'd have found out. But I wasn't reading the Bible. And we got set free. If you could be a fly on the wall or mosquito in the car when my wife and I are driving alone, you would hear us say many times just in the privacy of our conversation, we are so grateful when God called us and all that he's done in our lives. Because we know us and we know how we're different. But I can take your, it goes right back to here. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do. If you look at that prayer beginning at verse 17, where we pray that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, they might know what is the hope of his calling. When you come in tomorrow, I'd like you to sit down, put your hand here. Why there? Well, the bobbies is out of your belly, shall flow rivers of living water. Okay? That word belly in Hebrew means womb. Wait a minute, we guys haven't got one of those. It's figurative for the spirit, the place where things are conceived. When, and you would pray Ephesians 1, 17 to 20 for yourself in your own words. What you're doing is asking the Holy Spirit to help activate your human spirit so that you might come away from this weekend with revelation. Not just more knowledge, but revelation. That you might see something you haven't seen before. Because Paul tells us the knowledge of God comes by revelation of the Spirit, not by the intellect. There are a lot of people who have a lot of Bible knowledge, but it doesn't get walked out in day-to-day -day living in their lives. I was um, lecturing in Hawaii many years ago at the University of the Nations, and the founding president of a very famous evangelical Canadian seminary was there, the founding president. And I knew that his marriage was in a lot of trouble. A year later, I was in Hong Kong teaching, and uh, one of the students came up to talk with me, introduced herself, told me where she's from, and only she did, I discovered this was this theologian, seminary president's oldest daughter, and she starts to unload on me about what her family's like on the inside without knowing that I knew her father, and there's no reason to tell her. She didn't need to know, and I thought, oh my goodness. Here is a Hebrew scholar, and he can't apply what he knows to his family, to his marriage, and to his family life. Something is wrong. So, if you, I will give you lots of personal illustrations of the things that we're talking about out of our own life, out of our family life, out of my personal life, out of our ministry life. I have nothing to say to you that is theory. We're only going to talk to you about what we've proven is true and real. Remember Acts chapter 1, verse 1, all that Jesus began to do and to teach? By the way, when you write a scripture down, if you write the book, you forget the numbers, don't you? So leave a space, write the numbers, and then go back and, and write the book and you won't forget the book and then you can keep up. Okay? That'll just help you. So Acts 1.1. 1, 1, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. That was the secret of his authority. That he was living the message. And so I'm going to be as practical over the weekend as I know how to be. Because... Who we believe God to be has implications for daily living in every aspect of our lives. In 1978, I was invited to Australia to speak at a national teachers, Christian teachers conference. Well, I didn't know what to talk about. I would become principal of our Christian school, but when I became principal of our Christian school in Hawaii, I don't know if I even believed in Christian education. But I knew how to run discipleship training, so I ran the school like discipleship training. 
and they invited me, and I came, and I spoke on who God is, <laughs> how to recognize his voice, and how to pray as it applied to education. So impacting that the people who organized that conference came to Hawaii to the university to take discipleship training as a result. But if you follow me all over the world, because since 1978, I have lectured on over 20 nations on the biblical foundations of education. In fact, I fly home early Sunday morning, and five hours later, I fly to Singapore and then on to Indonesia. Be my 35th visit there in 15 years, where I'm a consultant for a large private Christian school, a faculty of 200, a student body of 1,600 children. And I, this will be my 35th visit in 15 years where I'm discipling them on the biblical foundations of education. But if you knew me at all and knew discipleship training, you'd listen to my lectures on education and go, Paul's not as smart as they think he is. I know where he got all this. Yeah, you'd be right. All I did was take the principles of discipleship and apply it to education. So the challenge that I throw out to you about this weekend is, if you learn your lessons well this weekend, we will have put into your hands some tools and keys that will help you be successful in the future in anything God might ask you to do. Missions or not. Ministry, traditional ministry or not. That's how much I believe in what we're going to talk about. Because you get your focus in the right place. It's all about knowing Him. Because knowing Him is eternal life, isn't it? Okay? So in Ephesians 5.1, St. Paul says, Then as beloved children, be imitators of God. It's not being like some actress or some rock singer. It's being like Jesus. By the way, I'm going to talk about God all the time. But you know, when I talk about God, I'm talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because what's true of the Father is true of the Son, is true of the Spirit, except function. Function could be a little different. But they are the same. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay, three questions for you. Raise your hand. Do you want to become a man or woman of faith? Everybody? Oh, good. And heaven and God goes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because you just gave him permission to make your life more difficult. <laughs> Sorry, it's too late. You already raised your hand. <laughs> Faith only becomes a personal possession through tests and trials. And you're thinking, oh, man, why did I raise my hand? That proves you need this message. <laughs> if you regret raising your hand. We'll quote about A.W. Tozer, the well-known pastor, author from the 40s and 50s and 60s on the whole subject of the basis of faith. Secondly, do you want to be a casualty in the last days if these are the last days? Or do you want to be a victorious survivor? Anybody want to be a casualty? No, no, we want to be victorious survivors. If you listen carefully, we're going to give you an insurance policy on how you can be a victorious survivor and not a casualty in the last days, if these are the last days. Thirdly, do you want to hear Jesus say, depart from me, I never knew you? Or do you want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant? Well, I know the answer. Okay. Listen carefully, and you will get instruction on how to ensure that you hear Jesus say, well done, and not depart from me. That's how I found. Wow, this must be a really important weekend. Yeah, it is. Because God's important. All right. A Facebook sermon. Do you know there are Facebook sermons? Atheism. The belief there was once absolutely nothing. And nothing happened to the nothing until the nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything and everywhere. Then, a bunch of the exploded everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits, which then turned into dinosaurs. <laughs> and they mock your beliefs. Don't let anybody convince you that you're intellectual. The smartest intellectual thing you ever did was to come to Christ. 
the most logical, reasonable thing you ever did was to come to Christ. All right. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier, more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Well, God is just, God is merciful, and God is faithful. So really what Jesus was saying is you're, you're neglecting God. You're majoring on the minors. We don't want to do that. We want to major on the major. Not get caught up. You know, I attended a church. If I named my pastor for 17 years, probably everybody in the room would recognize his name. But I used to go to church week after week, and I would count how many t Sundays before praise and worship mentioned Jesus' name in a song. We knew who we were worshiping, but, but sometimes we'd go three weeks and not be one worship song that even mentioned Jesus' name. So if you come in there and didn't know this, what this place was, you'd be wondering who they're worshiping. I mentioned that our motto in you for the mission is to know God and make him known. And it goes on to say, oh, uh, let's go back. I, I left it out. Anyway, it, our, we have something we call our foundational values. And our first value is to know God, his nature, character, and his ways. And if you don't know what that means, by the end of this weekend, you will know what that means. To know God, his nature, character, and his ways. Because we're going to define terms and make it clear what, it, what, what we mean when we talk about the nature of God, the character of God, etc. J.I. Packer, what were we made for? To know God. What aim should we have in life? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? To know God. What is the best in life? To know God. What in human gives God most pleasure? Knowledge of himself. J.I. Packer, a British theologian. All right, you've all heard of Jack Hayford. The issue of faith is never founded on our ability to move the mountain, but faith in the mountain maker. By the way, you might say, why do you quote all these people? Why are you bringing all these in? Because I want you to know that what you need to know is out there if you're paying attention. We read stuff. You know what? We even read the Bible and don't do what it says. We could do it right then. I'm going to quote a scripture a little later on where St. Paul says, think about your calling, brothers and sisters. And I ask people, when you read that, in 1 Corinthians, did you actually stop and do what it said? I've never yet met anybody who did. We just read the words. But he says, think about your calling. And whoever stops when he read that and actually does what it suggests should be done. Well, because we read the words. It becomes theory to us rather than day-to-day -day reality. All right. Uh, a few things I will skip, okay? Just because you can pick it up late if you're interested. All right, okay. George MacDonald was a Scottish author who wrote in the beginning of the 20th century, early 1900s. People like C.S. Lewis, who is now very popular in the United States and his writings, he lauded this man for bringing him to a greater knowledge of God, George MacDonald. And he said, everything depends on the kind of God one believes in. Well, Paul Hawkins says it a little differently. Paul Hawkins says, what you believe about God determines what you believe about everything else. In fact, if you say you don't believe in God, that determines what you believe about everything else. You can't get away from God even if you try. Now, let's repeat what I said. What you believe about God determines what you believe about everything else. If you have wrong ideas about God, 
it leads to wrong ideas about yourself, others, and the world around you. We're going to find out how the world has preconceived ideas about God, even though they don't even believe in Him, but they've concluded there are certain things must be true about Him, and the things that they believe are wrong, and that leads them to wrong conclusions about all kinds of other things. So, we want to make sure in our growing relationship with the Lord, that we are living in the reality of the truth of, what he's, of who He is. All right. Christianity is decaying and going down the gutter because the God of modern Christianity is not the God of the Bible, A.W. Tozer. Anybody here who does not know who Tozer was, one person. Okay, some people. Okay. A.W. Tozer was a pastor with the Christian Missionary Alliance. He died in 1963. He wrote 45 books. If you read them, they're, they're right on today. You can, his best book is called The Pursuit of God. You can download it free on the internet as an ebook. The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer. When I was 15, my mother gave me a set of his books that I am still reading. Not because they're complicated, but because they are so simple. Now, he, he would have said this in the 40s or 50s. Christianity is decaying and going down the gutter because the God of modern Christianity is not the God of the Bible. Can't imagine what he's thinking now up in heaven with Jesus. I was on an airplane flying to Switzerland, and I don't normally pick up newspaper, but I did this day, and it was USA Today, and I turned the religion page, and here was an article called Good God, and the more I read the article, the more I wanted to write the author, give her a big piece of my mind, <laughs> a big piece. She's professor of Skidmore College in upstate New York, a professor of comparative religions, and the reason I wanted to give her a big piece of my mind is because even the title of her article would cause people to question God. Subtitle, you notice, says, let's quit asking why the Almighty sends tsunamis, earthquakes, and tornadoes, or earthquakes, and instead focus on questions that actually mean something. This article appeared in USA Today just following Katrina that devastated New Orleans. And several months before that was the devastating tsunami of Southeast Asia. In the opening paragraph, she identifies something in theology called the theodicy problem. Stated this way, if God is good, he is not God. And if God is God, then he's not good. What's your response to that? Nah. Why don't they just read the Bible? God's God, God's good. I have asked seminary graduates, did you discuss the theodicy problem in seminary? Oh, yeah. I said, did you have a solution? No. I said, I got a solution. God's God and God's good. That settles it. <laughs> but the question is, why would they argue this? Why don't they just read their Bible? She goes on later in the article to explain how Orthodox, not orthodox in the sense of Eastern Orthodox churches, denominations, but traditional, old-fashioned Orthodox Christianity, okay? She defines for this how Orthodox Christians historically have explained away natural catastrophes, along with some sarcastic comments, because the argument doesn't hold any water. Then she explains how Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and Buddhists explain natural catastrophes, along with some sarcastic comments, because none of them hold any water. Do you have an adequate explanation for natural catastrophes? Do you have a view of God that when terrible things happen, you go, God? Do you know, when the Southeast Asian tsunami hit, the hardest hit was northern province of Sumatra, the island, the main, one of the islands of Indonesia, the province of Aceh. 
Aceh is where the radical separatist Muslim movement is founded in Indonesia that wants to break away from Indonesia. There were, in that village that was most devastated was a Christian church with 400 members. On the 24th of December, the pastor of this congregation went to the local chief of the village, a Muslim mullah, asking permission to have a Christmas celebration in their church building in the village. And he forbid it. He said, no, you go up on the mountain outside the village and have your celebration." So on the Christmas morning, the whole, all the Christians, all 400, trekked up the mountain to have their Christmas celebration in obedience to the political religious leader. They had such a good time in celebrating, it was too late and too dark to go back down to the village, so they spent the night on the mountain. And before they got back on the morning of the 26th, the tsunami came and completely destroyed the village, and not one Christian died. And the mullah was heard, was heard to say, is the Christian God punishing us because we didn't let them celebrate in their church building? Is the Christian God more powerful than the Muslim God? Prior to this tsunami, when you landed in Indonesia at immigration, there was a sign telling you that foreigners were not allowed into the province of Aceh because the political hotbed was just too dangerous. That's all changed now because they, def they, they needed help. There's even, I have a friend who even has a Christian school inside that province now as a result of the tsunami. Now, Christians did die in other places. But when you get all the facts and all the information, you always come down on the side of vindicating God. Do you, any of you know who Winky Prattney is? New Zealand Bible teacher, evangelist. He's, about, he's a little younger than me. And he was called after that tsunami and was asked, who caused it? He said, all I know is God's God and I'm not. Yeah. In other words, we don't know who caused it. But we always blame God, don't we? And if you always blame God for everything, then you're not a very happy person. Do you know that I have a friend who believes that all aborted babies go to hell? Because his theology, his belief about God, does not allow him to find a way to get them to heaven. But that means that God is unjust. That means the Bible contradicts itself. Because the Bible says God is just in all of his ways. So instead of judging God, we should be judging our theology. So I would say to you, if your theology leads you to question the goodness of God, don't question God's goodness, question your theology. Just let that sink in a second. If your theology leads you to question the goodness of God, don't question God's goodness, question your theology. Otherwise, the Bible contradicts itself. What happens is, using our limited intellect and experience, we interpret the scriptures, create a theology, and then we use it to judge God. Vern Poitras is professor of biblical Ter interpretation at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. And his book is called God-Centered Biblical Interpretation. So in other words, you have to interpret everything in the scriptures consistent with who God is as a loving, holy, wise, faithful, just, merciful, gracious, good, kind, forgiving God. If not, then the Bible is contradictory because God says it because the Bible says God is those things. So I would even say this, if your theology leads you to conclude that prayer doesn't change anything, don't not pray, change your theology. Because Jesus found it necessary to pray and his theology was perfect. <coughs> so, we're going to start with God and we're going to judge everything consistent with who he says he is. We'll come back to this article a little later on, all right? To, ex to explain something else and, and that she talks about later in the article. 
All right, so we said, it's all about knowing God. YWAM's motto should be the church's motto, to know God and make Him known. Yeah. Yeah. That ought to be what we're all about. We're all about. <coughs> but, do you know that words evolve definition based on common usage? Look at me, folks. Pizza is not awesome. And fellas, I don't care how gorgeous she is, she ain't awesome. When a young man says a young woman is awesome, what he's actually saying is he's afraid of her. Which is probably true, but that's not what he meant to communicate. Because the word awesome means full of awe. We used to sing, our God is an awful God, because awful meant full of awe. But awful became disgusting. So we sing our God is an awesome God. The word awesome in the, he in the scriptures, a Hebrew word is also translated fear of the Lord. So when it talks about an awesome God, it's the same word that's translated fear of the Lord in the Old Testament. So awesome means full of awe. What does awe mean? A fearful respect for authority. So young people, find another adjective. Make up one if you need to. Because everything, contrary to the Lego movie, everything is not awesome. <laughs> now you won't be able to get the song out of your head. See, if everything is awesome, after a while nothing is awesome. Awesome is a Bible word that describes who God is. The scriptures tells us that God is awesome and the things that he does are awesome. Now that I pointed it out and you find your young people using it, you're going to start to laugh. I was being driven into, I live in Colorado Springs and I was being driven into the Rocky Mountains a few years ago to speak at a weekend church's men retreat. And after two hours of the five hour drive, I said to the driver, excuse me, but do you know any other adjective besides awesome? <laughs> You know you're teenagers. Everything is awesome. And if everything is awesome, then nothing's awesome. This is a Bible word that describes God as you can't have it. I'm taking it back. So I tell the, the people who English is their second language, don't let the Americans contaminate your English. So make up a word that means what you think awesome should mean. That's what we did when I was a teenager. One of our favorite words was barfalations. That meant bah! disgusting. Barfalations. Make up your own. All right. Okay, I have a question for you. Turn to one of your friends or your neighbors sitting next to you or across the table and tell them what your calling is. If you don't know, say, well, why do you think I'm here? <laughs> By the way, we will take a break halfway through the evening, so you'll know. Almost invariably, whenever a believer is asked, what is your calling, they will give a vocational response, like, I'm called to be a pastor, or, I'm called to be the wife of the pastor, <laughs> or, I'm called to be an evangelist to preach the gospel, bless God. Or, I'm called to teach the word of God. And we give a vocational response. Now, biblically, that is not an incorrect response. But in terms of frequency, significance, and value, it's way down on the list. And when you study this word in the scriptures, you come to the conclusion that the word calling is more a relational word than it is a vocational word, biblically. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, turn there. Ephesians 4, 1 
St. Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Now, the Greek word there for calling literally means invitation. So we could quote it this way. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the invitation with which you've been invited. If you're invited up to Sequoia for a birthday party in December, do you know how to go dressed appropriately? I hope so. If you're invited to a formal wedding, do you know how to go dressed properly and not shorts and flip-flops? Remember the guy in the New Testament got kicked out of the wedding because he wasn't dressed properly? See, you can, be, you can be worthy of the invitation because you know what you're invited to. So when St. Paul says, think about your calling or think about your invitation, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, it's the same Greek word that we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, consider your calling, brothers and sisters, or think about your calling, brothers and sisters. I referred to it earlier in the evening. What's interesting and the rest of the chapter, St. Paul goes on and paraphrases a passage from Jeremiah chapter 9 that basically says this, if you're really rich, don't brag about it. If you're really smart, don't brag about it. If you're really strong, don't brag about it. You should only brag about one thing, and that is that you know God. Do you know what we mean by a name dropper? Do we like name droppers? No. Well, does anybody here know who Billie Jean King is? For those who don't know, who is she? Very famous woman tennis player. Okay. So famous that the U.S. Open, one of four major, major tennis tournaments in the world, in Flushing, New York, is called the Billie Jean King Tennis Center. Well... I have played tennis with Billie Jean King. And you're probably thinking, oh, Paul must be really good. And if I wanted to leave that impression, I would just go on and leave you hanging. But I have too much fear of God on me to do that. Let me tell you the circumstances. In university, I took a beginner's evening tennis class just to have people to play tennis with. I wasn't a beginner, but I wasn't an intermediate either. And Billie Jean was a student in our university. So our coach invited her to come and demonstrate serves. And because I was top of the competition in the class, competition ladder, I was the one chosen to return the serves. So strictly speaking, I played tennis with Billie Jean King. We don't like name droppers. Except the Bible says you're supposed to be a name dropper. Look at it, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, that basically says this, if you're rich, don't brag about it. If you're really smart, don't brag about it. If you're really strong, don't brag. Only brag that you know me, says the Lord. Now, that word know in Hebrew is yada. I didn't say yada, yada, yada. I said yada. It means to know by personal experience through intimate contact. It's talking about relationship, not knowledge of. It means to know in many forms, but the scholars tell us its highest definition, its highest usage, is to know by personal experience through intimate contact. By the way, don't you dare think that the whole concept of intimacy with Jesus is a modern Christian buzzword. It's not. It's Bible. The Bible is filled with intimate language about our relationship with God. Now, in biblical interpretation, there's something called the law of first use. The first time a Greek or Hebrew word is used in the scriptures sets the foundation for understanding that word throughout the scriptures. So if we would go back and see the first time we find the word call or calling, that will give us some understanding of what was being communicated. Because in Ephesians and in Corinthians, the Greek word for calling literally means invitation, just like the Hebrew word did. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. 
Verse 15. There we are told that God put Adam in the garden and he told him to tend it and to keep it. That word keep is the he translated from the Hebrew word shamar, which literally means build a boundary protection around the garden. Why would God tell Adam to build a boundary protection around the garden? What did God know that we don't think he told Adam? What did the garden need protecting from? Oh, the talking snake. Did he do his job? Doesn't appear so. Why? Because the talking snake got in the garden. Oh, by the way, e, when God told Adam that, he wasn't created yet. And if he's anything like today's husband, he frequently forgets to tell the wife all the details. <laughs> by the way, uh, let's fasten your seatbelt a second. This is controversial, but I might as well throw it out there. It's very interesting to think about. There are some Bible scholars that believe when it says Adam, God took a, a rib out of Adam's side, that that's not what it actually meant in Hebrew. What it actually is meaning is that God took his female side out. Do you remember when God said it's not good for Adam to be alone? That implies that God had an afterthought. Like, why didn't I think of this before? Does God have afterthoughts? Not, not ever. Not just not normally, not ever. He thinks about all the implications. The Hebrew scholars tell us actually what that verse should say is, Adam has begun to distance himself from us, and that is not good. And so they believe Adam was created androgynous, both male and female, and God took his female side out, didn't take a rib out. Why do women, generally speaking, respond to the gospel more than men do, generally speaking? Why are women more spiritually sensitive than men? And so the understanding is that God took his female side out to draw him back to God through the, what became known as the woman. Well, just something for you to think about. So there they are in the Garden of Eden. The talking snake is talking to Eve. The Hebrew scholars say the Hebrew implies that Adam was right at her elbow during this discussion. And he didn't protect or protest. He went right along with the deception. Men, stop blaming Eve for your problems. Not one amen from the women? Amen. <laughs> I grew up in Ventura, and my job every summer on my parents' half acre was to keep the half acre free of weeds, and I hated it. The, the hot Southern California sun in those days, the ground would get so hot you couldn't put your bare foot on the ground. And I'd be leaning on my hoe, feeling sorry for myself, thinking to myself, if only Eve had not sinned, I wouldn't be pulling weeds. <laughs> when you're suffering, don't you want to blame somebody? <laughs> if you read the text carefully, it appears... Because then it says in verse 9 of chapter 2, or chapter 3, it says, they, they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the eating, and they hid themselves, remember? Why would you hide from all goodness and all love and all mercy? Well, they had something to hide, that's why. Because their eyes were open, not the eyes of their spirit, the eyes of their flesh, they realized they were naked. And it says, God called. There's that word, call. It literally means invitation in Hebrew. And then God said, Adam, where are you? Why would God say, where are you, when he knew where they were? Well, the Hebrew scholar says, it actually says a lot more than just where are you. <clears throat> but they say, it ought to say this. Adam, the essence of your person has ceased to exist. I cannot locate you. What does the Bible say? The soul that sins shall die. What is spiritual death? Separation from God. Yes, he also asked because he wanted them to own up on what had happened. Now, you went to, if you went to Sunday school as a child and you had flannel graph lessons and you saw, you saw the pictures on the Bible stories, and what happens because of those pictures, we automatically read the story and we, 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 we see the pictures. 
But if you read it carefully in Genesis there, it appears that Eve repented and Adam blamed God. And God kicked Adam out of the garden and didn't keep Eve out of the garden. She chose to go with her husband. Now, this full disclosure, this is not full agreement on this. This is somewhat controversial. But why not enjoy some of the controversy? It's nice to think about it. So, it's all about an invitation. What was God inviting Adam and Eve to do in the cool of the evening? To come and walk in intimate fellowship. Based on the law of first usage, it appears this word calling is more a relational word than a vocational word. Which means you now know what you're calling in. You are called to walk in intimate fellowship with Jesus. And everything else is out of the overflow of that. Do you remember Jesus said to some disciples, depart from me, I never knew you? That's the Greek word gnosko, which, which is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word to know, what we found in Jeremiah. To know God. Okay? Brag that you know God. You're supposed to go everywhere bragging that you know the king of the universe. So are we doing it? That's why I said, he wants us to be a name dropper. We know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So are we doing it? The priority then is our relationship with God and everything else comes out of that. When Jesus said to some of the disciples who'd raised the, the dead and healed the sick, he said, depart from me, I never knew you. Which meant there was no relationship there. Ooh. So what's your insurance policy? Make sure you're in relationship with Jesus. I'm going to sh maybe later on we can tell you the kind of people that God seeks after. See, I don't just want to be a person that seeks God. I want to be a person that God seeks after. And there's three categories of people that God seeks after in the scriptures. All right. So. We went to Ephesians 4.1. We went to 1 Corinthians 1.26. We went to Jeremiah 9.23 and 24. Another Facebook sermon. Little boy said, are you related to anyone famous? Well, I don't want to brag, but I heard Dad calling God his father. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. All right. Oh, one more verse. Look at Genesis 4.1. I'm not sure which version of the Bible you're reading. New King James. New King James. Read it for us. Which one? Genesis 4 1. I'm having trouble with my glasses, but now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time. You don't need to know that part. Okay. <laughs> you guys, this is really weird. Because when it says Adam knew his wife, it's the Hebrew word yada. We're told to yada God and Adam yada his wife. This is weird. No, no, no. It's not weird. Everybody knows the most intimate, righteous relationship possible between two people is a relationship between a man and his wife. Notice I said most intimate, righteous relationship because there are plenty of intimate relationships that are not righteous. So when the Holy Spirit uses the same word to describe a man's relationship with his wife and our relationship with God, what is implied is the depth of intimacy that is possible. Because God is spirit, it's not a physical relationship, of course, but it is a spiritual relationship. So other versions say Adam slept with his wife or had relations with his wife, meaning she got pregnant. It's a Hebrew idiom that uses the word yadah. That's one of the first times we discover some of the intimate language that's in the scriptures about what God wants in our relationship with him. So everything, our whole motivation, our whole focus should be getting to know God better, deeper relationship. And that's why you heard me say an ongoing, deepening 
growing intimate relationship with Jesus, a relationship that's based on regular, consistent, two-way communication. Why do I add that last part? Because everybody knows that we build and maintain relationship through communication. If a husband and wife go to a marriage retreat for a weekend, what's the first question they're asked? Are you talking to one another? Because if there's no communication, there's a problem. What's the second question? Are you listening? Because if someone's talking and no one's listening, that's another problem. So we build and maintain relationship through regular, consistent, two-way communication. But there are whole denominations that decry that God speaks today. A.W. Tozer addressed that when he said, there are those who teach that this is the voice of God. And Tozer writes, what sense does it make for a silent God to become vocal in a book and when he finished the book to go silent again? It's not that God has spoken, but God is speaking. He's by his very nature continuously articulate. Oh, I love to say that. He's by his very nature continuously articulate. Because God wants to speak to us. He wants to reveal his heart to us. Many years ago, I took a YWAM team from Switzerland to Calcutta, India. There was no youth with a mission in India at that time. Today, there's maybe 5,000 Indian missionaries and 100 operating locations on the subcontinent. But then there was no YWAM there. We, our team drove from Switzerland to Calcutta. <coughs> Have you got a world map in your head? Okay, here's the world map. Okay, there's Switzerland. Here's, if I say over here, here's Switzerland, and here's Calcutta. What's between Switzerland and Calcutta? Well, look. Austria, Bulgaria, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. Long drive. No big deal. First YWAM team did it in 70. Second team in 71. Third in 72. Fourth in 73. Fifth in 74. We were the sixth in 75. No big deal. More difficult now than it was then, especially for Americans, of course, these days. And the team, when the team got there, we said, God, why are we here? Because we obeyed and went, but he never told us what we were to do. Now, in those days, YWAM did evangelism. That's what we did. We did evangelism. But God said to us, no evangelism. You will pray every day until I, until I tell you you're finished. It's a good thing God gave me a people with a heart for prayer. Or we'd had rebellion on our hands. Because all we did for two months was pray. Every day. Pray, 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 pray. And one day, we're sitting in the floor in a circle in Calcutta. And India sit in the floor because it's the coolest place you can find. And we're waiting on God having prepared our hearts to know what he, wants on our, what he wanted us to pray about that day because the world is the limit. God's smarter than we are, so we don't tell him what we want to do. We ask him what he wants us to do. And we, we put it on him. And it got very quiet. And somebody prayed a prayer which I had never heard prayed before. But I'm sure it had been prayed by others. And this was the prayer. Lord Jesus, would you come and sit in this circle today? We would sit at your feet. We would learn from you. We would lean our head on your breast. We would listen to your heartbeat. And it got really quiet. Have you ever been in God's presence where it was hard to breathe? You know, the Hebrew word glory means heavy, literally in Hebrew. So, we were running a school of prayer in South Africa, and during the praise and worship, the glory cloud of God's presence came into the room. All 20 students and staff fell on the floor, unable to get up for two hours, because the glory cloud comes down, it's heavy. Just like happened on the day of the dedication of the temple. It's not weird, you guys, it's in the Bible. Well, you could explain that with a bunch of weird intercessors. <laughs> Except the base leader's pet dog was also in the classroom. And when the glory cloud of God's presence came in, the dog fell down on the floor, whimpering for two hours, unable to get up. Explain that. So there we were. Listen, can you hear my, breathe, my breathing? That's how we were breathing, so we didn't disturb the Holy Spirit. 
And we knew that if our eyes were open, we would literally see him sitting in that circle. And then he spoke to us with these words. I will quote exactly what he said. Oh, if only you could know what it means to me that you would say, Lord Jesus, come and sit in this circle. Oh, if only you could know what it means to me that you want to sit at my feet and learn from me. Oh, if only you could know what it means to me that you want to lean your head on my breast and listen to my heartbeat. Oh, if only you could know what it means to me because so few people ever do. We didn't know he felt like that. And we melted into that terrazzo floor and worship and adoration to the Lord Jesus while those words kept ringing in our ears. Oh, if only you could know what it means to me because so few people ever do. Do you understand? He didn't just share a piece of his mind with us. He shared his heart with us. And that's what lovers do. Perhaps of all the prayer experiences I've had over 47 years, that's the one that most convinced me that what he, when he calls us to the place of prayer, what he wants is deepening relationship. Oh, if only you could know what it means to me, he said. And we, we turn it into something else. It's all about what we're doing for him rather than it's being available for him. So, when we read it's about relationship with God. We're called to walk in intimate fellowship with Him, in relationship with Him, and everything is out of the overflow of that. You know what? You get set free so you can seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness. Because it's no longer about performance. It's a simple, childlike obedience just doing the next thing Jesus tells you to do. Okay. What makes relationship with God possible? What about Jesus? Come on, my arms are tired. <laughs> huh? Oh, no. I, I deliberately misled you. Okay. See, Jesus' death and resurrection did not make a relationship with God possible. I baited you to get you to say that so I could say this. <laughs> Listen to me. It's not semantics. Jesus' death and resurrection did not make a relationship with God possible. Jesus' death and resurrection made possible restoration, a broken relationship with God. How can I say that? Because Adam and Eve were in relationship with God before they sinned. And Jesus hadn't come yet. Why is this important? Because if the Father sent Jesus to die to restore broken relationship, that means relationship is very important to God. And you and I need to make important to us what is important to him. Have you been in love? Don't answer out loud. When you fall in love with somebody, what happens? Don't you start to make important to you what's important to them? Don't you hang on every word they say, hoping they'll express a desire that you can fulfill? That's what happens. So are we in love with Jesus yet? Are we making important to us what's important to him? Are we hanging on every word he said, hoping he'll express a desire that we can fulfill? Peggy and I have been married 52 years this year. We had an arranged marriage. Yeah, my father arranged it. We did a pretty good job. It's been 52 years. Only it wasn't my earthly father. It was my heavenly father. Yeah, how'd you go with that? <laughs> Except I'm not joking. The father arranged it. And when we come back, I'll tell you how I know. It's time for a break. How long, mistress? Matt, mistress? 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Come on, get up, walk around, get some to drink. This is for little boys and girls if you need to.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start. Muchas gracias, señorita. <laughs> Okay, quick little recap. Recap. God wants relationship with us. We're called to walk in intimate fellowship with Jesus. Falling in love means that we start to make important to us what's important to him. We hang on every word he said, or we ought to be. So I was a young school teacher on the prowl looking for a wife. You know. And I went to church one Tuesday night and we had a visiting choir from a Bible college a thousand miles away. And I'm sitting there during the concert thinking to myself, hmm, who's the piano player? So after the service, I asked the only person in the church that I knew, known anybody in the choir, who's the piano player, and he said they didn't know. I thought, oh, well, forget that. It's probably is a thousand miles away anyway, which turned out to be true. That was April. The following July, that person came up to me at church and said, remember the piano player? And I go, yeah, because I'm still on the prowl. <laughs> well, she's moved to our town from a thousand miles away. Well, what's her name? Well, we don't know. Well, that won't do any good. I can't go door to door in this town of 50,000 people to find her. So forget that. In December, I was talking to the wife, one of my best friends, who now lives in Lindsay. We were from Ventura, but he, he's been living in Lindsay for almost 40 years. And I was talking to his wife, and he says, hey, remember, she says, remember the piano player? I go, yeah, because I'm still on the brow. And she says, well, She's a nurse. I work in the hospital. Her name's Peggy. I said, well, goodness sakes, get her telephone number. This sounds like God to me. <laughs> I mean, it's been eight months, and all of a sudden, possibility. Well, that's the story from my point of view. <laughs> Let's hear the story from Peggy's point of view. All Peg's life, she grew up in Oregon, and she, she knew she wanted to be a nurse and go to Bible college, but she never thought what she'd do after that. So she became a registered nurse, and her first year of Bible college in Eugene, Oregon, they came to Southern California on choir tour. And when they drove into Ventura, she fell in love with the town. Her last year of Bible college, they returned, but when they got there, their concert was canceled. And through a series of extremely unusual circumstances, they ended up in my church. They'd never been there before, and they never came back again, just that one time. Of course, she didn't know there was a single school teacher on the prowl looking for a wife eyeing her as she played the piano. So she didn't believe in blind date. She, in fact, just turned one down that morning when my friend comes to her. She's working in intensive care and says, uh, may I speak to you? No, I'm too busy. Come back later. Peggy was so professional. <laughs> so my friend went back later and said, I have this friend. His name is Paul. He's a believer like you and me. He's a school teacher. has a really nice car. Come on. You all know what we're like. <laughs> Of course, it was true, 1965 Chevelle Malibu 327 Super Sport, four on the floor, which if you step on the gas too much, you had to go to the chiropractor. So Peggy thought to herself, I'm too busy to say, the end, to say no and explain why, so I'll say yes. Go out the guy once, won't even need to impress him, that'll be that. So I got the telephone number. When you don't know somebody and you come up on the phone, what do you do? You ask questions. And so we agreed that I could pick her up on Saturday night. We'd go to those friends' house for the evening. And 27 days later, we were engaged to be married. Well, it was all arranged, I told you. Well, I wasn't a fast worker. It was all arranged. We used our engagement to get to know each other. So she invited me to her home for a meal, and she served my favorite appetizer, my favorite drink, my favorite salad, my favorite vegetable, my favorite meat, my favorite dessert. And I said to her, how do you know all this? She said, well, you talk a lot. <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is she listens. Because that's what lovers do. When you fall in love with somebody, you start to make important to you what's important to them. You hang on every word they say, hoping they'll express a desire that you can fulfill. Now, you know the reputation of American garages, don't you? 
Some people's garage has got so much junk you can't put the car in the garage. Amen. Or some, everybody has to get out of the car before you pull the car in because once you get the car in, you can't open the doors. You know? Well, I believe in a garage being used for the purpose for which it was built. Amen. So you can pull it in and everybody can open their doors all the way. I have a car that has opens the front doors open all the way 90 degrees. So the older people can get in and out easily. And um, I'm cleaning the garage, and there's a box on the top shelf, which I don't know what it is. I decide to bring it down and see if I can toss it out. And when I do, as I bring it down, it turns, and in red marker on the side, it says, Paul, if you find this, do not open it, Peggy. Well, I'm an obedient, submissive husband. So I push the box back on the shelf. If she said don't open it, there's a reason. That was July. I never found out what was in the box. Until Christmas morning, we're preparing to open our family gifts, and she says to me, you'll never guess what I got for you. And I thought, well, of course I will. That's a challenge. I have a file in this computer for unfulfilled desires. And all I got to do is access the data in that file, and I will tell you what's in that box. So I opened the file called Unfulfilled Desires, and not one byte of data. Misfile, did a full search. <laughs> not one memory of anything I said I wanted that I did not have from that previous year. Until I opened the box. When I opened the box, I remembered that one time that year I had said, oh, I would like that. And she remembered. That's what lovers do. So, are we in love with Jesus yet? Are we making important to us what's important to him? Are we hanging on every word he says, hoping he'll express a desire that we can fulfill? Because what in his heart is relationship. Do you know Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest? Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with God. I'm trying to stand the way. Can you see if I'm standing here? No. Who can? <laughs> well, so you know, this projector does not work with our Mac computers. So we had to download this presentation onto this tablet. Is that what it's called? And But it doesn't have a place a USB port to plug in my clicker so I can walk around and move around. So I have to stay attached to this. And it doesn't do any good to have somebody else do it because, um, because I go back and forth. Okay, then I have. Don't go too far. <laughs> somebody once said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Only our main thing isn't a thing, it's a one. It's him. So we want to get our focus right. Oswald Chambers, I mean, uh, yeah, well, the main thing about Christianity is not the work we do, but the relationship that we maintain. Now, would you open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. Me again? Yeah, because you're real close. Okay. Chapter 2, okay. Therefore, we must <clears throat> give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just reward, how shall we, es <clears throat> we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which is at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness. Just the first, just the first okay. Yeah. okay. Did you hear what it said? Be careful, more careful of what you heard, lest you drift away. Okay, now turn to chapter 4, verse 2. 
chapter 4, verse 2. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. For the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. That's good, right there. Did you hear what it said? Why didn't the word they heard profit them? Because they didn't mix it with faith. What does James say? Faith without works is dead. So, if you're going to be benefited from this weekend, you have to decide what you're going to do with what you're hearing. So, in this first session, when we built the foundation that God wants relationship with us, an ongoing, deepening, growing, intimate relationship, a relationship based on regular, consistent, two-way communication, if you're going to be benefited from this, you've got to mix it with faith, which means you're going to take some kind of action, which means that some of your, some of your priorities must be reoriented. Some things that are not wrong in themselves must be set aside to give room for what your priorities, your reordered priorities might need to be. So that you're benefited from this time. Because let me say that after a weekend like this, you become more responsible. I don't want to scare you away. But you're responsible for what you have heard. And you don't want to bring leanness to your soul because you are being irresponsible with the perhaps new understanding that you're gaining and, and what God brought you here to accomplish in your heart. We're not interested in just passing on more information. We're interested in change. So I want to give testimony that this is life-changing. My life is continually being changed by the revelation that God is everything that he says that he is. So the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Okay? Oh, wrong button. Facebook sermon. Can't read it all. It says, it is not that the Lord has lost his power, it's that the church has lost its focus. I don't know this pastor, but I want you to see his sad testimony. As a pastor for 25 years, I was constantly tempted to focus more on my work than my Lord. It's been said that people do not do what you expect, they do what you inspect. Not once in 25 years did a church leader inspect my relationship with Jesus. I was evaluated by the popularity of my teaching and the effectiveness of the church's programs, but no one ever asked me if I was in love with Jesus. What a sad testimony, huh? A.W. Tozer, it is well for us to remember that divine human friendship originated with God. Had God not first said, you are my friends, it would be inexcusably brash for any person to say, I'm a friend of God. But since God claims us for his friends, it is an act of unbelief to deny the offer of such a relationship. It's his idea. It's not our idea. Okay? What's closest to your heart, Tozer wrote, is what you talk about. And if God is close to your heart, you will talk about him. You can fulfill, N.T. Wright, a well-known theologian, you can fulfill the commandments of the Bible better by falling in love with God than by trying to obey Him. The Christian faith is not a business transaction. It's not an arranged marriage where you receive a dowry of riches for compliance. Christianity only works if you're in love. I sometimes long to get away from all the theology and all the religious formalities and just have a relationship of being God's friend, walking with Him and enjoying His company. 
I really believe God loves to be enjoyed by his people. Derek Prince. Have we given enough people's opinions? Is the main thing, the main thing, to be keen, maintain the main thing is falling in love with Jesus? That's the question. Uh, oh, I keep hitting the wrong button. I go in the wrong direction. All right, we're going to skip this. Oh, one more. This is really good. Can't skip it. This is a survey done by LifeWay researchers. And I want you to see, this is a few years ago now, approximately six in ten churchgoers who were surveyed say Christianity is the only way to obtain eternal life, according to a new study by LifeWay Research. The survey, which questioned 3,000 adults who report that they attend a Protestant church at least once a month, examined doctrinal positions for part of what LifeWay calls the largest discipleship study of its kind. It found that plenty of churchgoers still struggle with basic truths about God, the Bible, and salvation. When it comes to heaven, for example, more than 25% of those surveyed disagreed with traditional Christian doctrine, saying instead that a person who is sincerely seeking God can obtain eternal life through religions other than Christianity. Did you catch that percent? Twenty-five percent of people who attended Christian churches were saying there's other ways to heaven besides Jesus. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not exactly surprising since Americans are used to having endless combinations of choices, says LifeWay Research President. Biblical truth is radical because it teaches that eternal life is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ alone. 82% said they believe the Bible is the written word of God and is totally accurate in all it teaches, which meant if they were in the 25%, they weren't reading their Bible. It's one thing to say it's the Word of God, another thing to know what it says so that you're, that you're in agreement with it. I'm going to take you down a road in a few moments, and then I'll explain to you why we go down that road. But what I will show you is that I've asked this question all over the world for over 40 years, and we'll see how we do when I ask the question in this group. Because most of the time, people sit there with a dumb stare looking back at me. On something that is so foundational in biblical Christianity that it is absolutely shocking. So, we know that we're made in God's image. I referred to this earlier. There it is, Genesis 1.26. What does it mean? We will quote it. We may use it in conversation. But have we ever thought about what it actually means? I look myself in the mirror, I see my image, but I don't see God. I see Paul. So what does it mean? Well, it means I made in the likeness. Well, what does that mean? Those words are interchangeable. Have you ever thought about it? Come on, talk to your neighbor for just a minute. Come on, what, what does it mean? Now, if you were in discipleship training and you've heard this teaching, bite your tongue. Don't give it away. Remember this passage? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is spirit. So when it says you're made in the image of God, you know what? You are a spirit. And if you are a spirit, you are spiritual. 
I went to the Speak in That Weekend retreat in the Rocky Mountains for a local church in western Colorado. And it was started on a Friday night and it was one of these kind of weekends. Raw, 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 we are men. <laughs> and I thought, oh brother, what's this? And I had a thought pop into my head. So I looked up in the scriptures to make sure my memory served me well, and it did. So I got up to speak, and I kind of stood like the Marlboro Man, because this is cowboy country. And like John Wayne, I said, Guess what, fellas? We're male temporarily, but we're spirit eternally. And this weekend, I'm going to focus on what's eternal, not what's temporary. <laughs> Kill that spirit right away. The next day, the pastor had to change his message. He'd been on staff of a men's organization for several years. <laughs> Come on, have you ever thought about it? You women are female temporarily. We men are male temporarily. Female male is part of our temporary identity, but it's not of eternal necessity. Galatians says there's no male or female in the kingdom of heaven. Contrary to Mormon doctrine, you women are not going to have babies for eternity. And how many of you are grateful for that? That's Mormon theology. Women go to heaven so they can keep having babies. That's your only purpose. By the way, there's a similar spirit between Islam and Mormonism. There's some overlap there, if you think about it. Okay? So, what does it matter you're spiritual? Because if you're spiritual, you can learn to worship in spirit. If you're spiritual, you can learn to pray all kinds of prayers in the spirit. And that, no, relax, it doesn't mean praying in an unknown tongue. In Corinthians, St. Paul said, I pray with the Spirit, and I pray with understanding. I sing with the Spirit, and I sing with understanding. But in Ephesians, he said, pray with all kinds of prayers in the Spirit. That means prayer which is directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you can pray in the Spirit in English or Spanish, or any other language, or Russian. Any other language that you might know. It's harder because you've got to get this cooperating with this instead of this competing with this. And this likes to be in charge. Remember what St. Paul said? The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak because the flesh wants to be in charge all the time. So we've got to learn. So, but we have the equipment. And because we're spirit, we're, spirit, we're spiritual, made in God's image, we can learn to recognize God's voice. Why? Because God speaks by His Spirit into our human spirit. Was anyone here born with the gift of walking? It's okay, laugh, it's funny. Because nobody is. You're born with all the equipment you need to walk, but you had to learn how to use the equipment. Right? Right? It's the same with learning to recognize God's voice. You are born with all the equipment, but you've got to learn how to use it. It's called practice, practice, practice. It's not a gift, it's a skill developed by practice. Some of us here learn to walk at a younger age than others because of some gifts of physical coordination. But we all learn to walk. I watched. Everybody walked in here their own fortune because I watched. So you learn to walk. So you know what? And because you, you didn't give up. You kept practicing. When you took a half a step and fell flat on your note, you know what? You didn't stand, sit there and say, I'll never learn how to do this. This is so hard. No, you got up and you tried again. And you didn't quit until you were successful. I have two sons. Both very athletic. When they, each of them was four years of age, he climbed on a bicycle and took off without a lesson. Just got on and took off. When it took me six weeks at the age of six with my father behind with a stick to encourage me because I was so afraid of hurting myself. Is that just, is that fair? Well, I learned to ride a bike and I can still ride one. This took longer, that's all. And so you can all learn to recognize God's voice for the sake of an ongoing, deepening, growing, intimate relationship with Jesus. 
Why? Because you're made in the image of God. He is spirit and you are spirit. So you are spiritual. Now there's two ways spiritual is used in the New Testament. One is like not, not, not functioning in the flesh, but functioning in the spirit, okay? But there's the other term that is, if you are spirit, you are spiritual. So you have the equipment you need to worship in spirit, to pray with all kinds of prayers in the spirit, to learn to recognize God's voice. Okay, throughout this week, we're going to put God in a box. Now, remember what it says at the bottom, which you can barely read. Remember, you can't put God in a box, so everything about it won't fit in this one. Okay? You don't need to make this box in your note, because we're going to give you this form filled out. Probably tomorrow. Okay. Not now. No, tomorrow. I don't want to steal my thunder yet. I'm not ready for them to know. It's there. Okay? So, God is spirit. I am, a, I am a chemist, and we physical scientists always tabulize our data. Remember physical science in school? Why do you do that? Two reasons. One, it helps you organize your information, and two, it helps you identify patterns in your information. So as we go through the weekend and we walk through, I'm going to help you organize your thoughts, and we're going to discover patterns so we find out what we're supposed to be about as we find it, discover who God is. That's where we're going, all right? So, we are spirit living in a body. This is A.W. Tozer. You know, Watchman Nee talked about spirit, soul, and body, which is biblical. But we have a word in Old English, an unfortunate word, soulish. And soulish meant of the flesh and not the spirit. So many English-speaking people think spirit good, soul bad. But you know what? Soul not bad. Soul good. <laughs> Psalms even talks about God's soul. So, so Tozer, instead of saying spirit, soul, and body, which tends to set spirit and soul against one another, Tozer says you are a spirit living in a body. You are a living soul. And C.S. Lewis wrote, you don't have a soul you are a soul. You have a body. The soul is intellect, will, and emotions. Okay? Facebook sermon. People be like, I'm spiritual. Well, I be like, demons are spiritual too. <laughs> so this isn't my opinion. Spirit-filled Life Bible, edited by Jack Hayford. The Greek word pneuma translated spirit. That part of a person capable of responding to God. All right? A normal English dictionary defines spiritual of relating to or consisting of or affecting the spirit. So if you're a spirit, you are spiritual. You get it? All right. International Center Bible Encyclopedia. The Greek word pneuma, spirit or spiritual. Endowed with the attributes of spirit. Any being made in the image of God who is a spirit and thus having the nature of spirit is a spiritual being. So, when we say we're made in the image of God, number one, we are spirit. Made in the image of God. So we are spiritual which means we can worship in spirit, we can learn to pray with all kinds of prayers in the spirit, we can learn to recognize God's voice. That's a given for us because we have the equipment. It's just that we've got to learn how to use it. That's all. Okay, number one. So God is spirit. We're made in his image. We are spirit. The Bible speaks much about the human spirit. Here's one example in Proverbs 20, 27. All right? So at the beginning, I took you to, one, to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. Why? Because he prays that we would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. So what I'm saying is, you are made in God's image, you are spiritual, so you, you can enter into an ongoing, deepening, growing, intimate relationship with Jesus, a relationship based on regular, consistent, two-way communication. You just got to pay the price for it. And it takes time. 
Your salvation is free, but everything else costs everything you got. So you can decide how much you want. <clears throat> Do you know why a lot of people sing about intimacy with Jesus but don't really want it? Because it's too expensive. When you get close to Jesus, you also get closer to the light. Remember it says he's light, 1 John chapter 1. When you get close to the light, what happens? More dirt shows up. You ever wash a window in the shade and when the sun shone on it, you hadn't washed it, you just moved the dirt around? We all have. So, you know, ah, they're clean. Ah, how do you see out of them? You know what I mean. So, when you're obedient to all the light you have, you're living up to all that you know is right, it draws you automatically closer to the loving heart of God. But when you get closer to the loving heart of God, you get closer to the light. Now more dirt shows up. And that's why many Christians sing about intimacy but do not want it because it's too expensive. Why? It'll cost you your pride, your unbelief, your anger, your lust, your rebellion, your unforgiveness. It's very expensive. Because the closer you get to the Jesus, the closer to the light. And dirt keeps showing up. <coughs> Excuse me. For me, it is a process of sanctification, being changed from glory to glory. Amen. All right, we're made in the image of God. Growing up in church, they always told me I had a personal, infinite God. I had studied geometry, so I had some sense of what infinite meant. <coughs> Excuse me, this top line... <coughs> must be Central Valley air. <coughs> this top line in geometry represents a line. And the arrow means no end point. So no beginning and no end is the definition. This is a ray or half line and has an end point but then it goes infinity in that direction. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> It'll go away. I love mints. <laughs> Found it. So I had some understanding of infinite means no beginning and no end, and God is infinite. But I didn't understand what it meant that He is personal. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and said to them, Jesus wants to be your personal Savior? Have you ever had anybody say that to you? What does that mean? Is that your personal pen? Oh, thanks, I'll make it my personal pen. <laughs> Can it be my personal pen and her personal pen at the same time? No. So don't tell me that God's personal God. Well, because he's God. What does it mean? Have you ever thought about it? It's very, it's a word right in the very vocabulary of Christians. Come on, foundations guys, bite your tongue. <coughs> I probably have you scared to answer after the other question. You know who Francis Schaeffer was? One of the leading Christian thinkers of our lifetime. Many Christian leaders like Focus on the Family founder and Campus Crusade for Christ founder all talked about how profoundly Francis Schaeffer and his writings impacted their thinking. <coughs> Excuse me, back in the 60s and 70s. Francis wrote, well here, Here's his story. He and his wife were Presbyterians and they moved to Switzerland in the 50s to start a children's ministry. Their children were in, were in university and they'd come home for holidays and they would bring college classmates home for, to Switzerland for the holiday. And as university students are wont to do, their faith was being challenged by their professors. 
And so their faith was being shaken. So they had lots of questions about truth and reality. And Dr. and Mrs. Shaker would spend hours talking to these young people and answering their questions. Very quickly, in the International University grape line, the word got out, go visit the Shapers. You can stay with them. In the village of Waymo, above Lake Geneva. And, so it's a, and they'll, they'll spend time talking to you, answering your questions. And so many began to come that a ministry called the Bree Fellowship was born. And the numbers kept growing, so finally Dr. Schaefer began to do lectures. Then he put his lectures in books. He wrote 45 books. Uh, the Age of Reason. The God who is there. He is there and he is not silent. Whatever happened to the human race? The Church at the end of the 20th century. How should we then live? Christian Manifesto. Pollution and the Death of Man. <coughs> Excuse me. Or some of the titles. But in all that he wrote, he, <clears throat> he made a major focus on everything being built on the foundation of a personal, infinite God. Personal and yet infinite, infinite and yet personal. The founder of Youth with a Mission, Lauren Cunningham, <clears throat> one of the two largest missions in the history of the church, and the only mission that's really worked in every nation of the world, Lord himself has been personally in every nation of the world and every territory. He's done a teaching for 47 years that I know called the four basic premises of Christianity. The four pillars upon which Christianity is built. And number one pillar is God is personal and infinite. Now, if one of the leading Christian thinkers in our lifetime and the founder of one of the largest missions in the history of the church think it's important, don't you think it must be really important? And yet I've asked this question all over the world, and even in a group like this with maybe 20, maybe even 20 pastors in a group, it usually takes a good 20 minutes of discussion to come up with a simple working definition of what it means. God is personal. You know why? Because we never thought about it. We just use the words because other people use the words. No wonder a lot of times our witness is so hollow because we speak what we don't know or understand. We are passing on information. And if we're questioned, we don't know what to say. If while you're all looking at me, and we were on a ground level, and I look out that window, and I watch another man shoot another man. And when I go <clears throat> to my friends Tommy and Tracy, look, Tracy, i got to go home to Peggy, and i got to go on to Asia. When the court case comes up, I'll tell you what I saw, and you can testify on my behalf. Well, they allow her to testify. Why not? Because it's secondhand information. It's hearsay. Okay? She didn't witness, so she has nothing to testify to. What happens when you ask the average Christian, let's go do evangelism? What's their first thing? What will I say? Do you know why they have nothing to say? Because they haven't test witnessed anything because they have nothing to testify to. All they have is secondhand information. When you enter into an ongoing, deepening, growing, intimate relationship with Jesus, a relationship based on regular, consistent, two-way communication, He is constantly engaging in your life, and you have so much that you've witnessed, you have a lot to testify to. So I'm on an airplane. <clears throat> I'm talking to a man who's an atheist, scientist, who writes science textbooks. And I said to him, do you believe in evolution as an explanation for origins? I knew he was going to say yes. Pride required it. And then I said, <clears throat> do you try to live consistent with that theory? Well, pride required him to say yes. I said, that's shocking. Because that means that we had rabbit for dinner last night, we can eat your daughter for dinner tonight. If everything is a result of an accident, time plus space plus chance, how do you distinguish between a rabbit and a human child? Why do you think the pagan progressives in, the, in America today protest about animal rights but kill human babies? My son and I were walking on the boardwalk in Santa Monica a few years ago, and here was an animal rights protest. 
And I said to the leader of the protest, do you believe in abortion? He said, of course. I said, then you're a pure hypocrite and I have no time for your message. And my son, who's a fierce debater, just lit into the guy and chewed him up. <laughs> That's pure hypocrisy. Animal rights, but you kill babies, human babies. Well, it's because they, they can't distinguish anymore because we're all the time of time plus space plus chance. Well, I wasn't getting through to him, so finally I changed my tactic. I said, let me tell you a story. <clears throat> I said, I had to fly to Asia, and my travel agent, who wasn't a believer, called me. She said, Paul, how much of a gambler are you? I said, God was always using my travels to witness to her about the power of God. I said, what's the problem, Kate? She said, well, <clears throat> you're flying from Hawaii to Singapore to Manila to Seoul back to Hawaii. Now, you always go economy. Here's the problem. There are no economy seats from Manila to Seoul. Now, I can write the whole economy ticket, but when you get to Manila, if there's no economy seat, you will pay 600 U.S. dollars to come home. I said, write the ticket. God will take care of it. You know God. Well, she didn't know God, so she thought I was crazy, and she told her entire staff. <clears throat> so I said, I flew to Singapore on this, on this ticket. And in the class I was lecturing on, there was a Chinese travel, Singaporean travel agency, uh, agent, and I said, Joyce, can you please get me confirmed in economy from Manila to Seoul? She said, of course. So she called my airline, and they said, no, not possible, overbooked for weeks. Besides, he needs to do that in Manila, not here in Singapore. Well, if you know Manila versus Singapore, you want to do it in Singapore. You don't want to wait till Manila. But she said, it's okay, I'll call again. So she called the second time, and they still said it's not possible. But she said, okay, I'll call again tomorrow. So that second day, she called the third time. They still said it was impossible. She said, okay, I can call again later. So she called the fourth time. They still said it was impossible. But she said, okay, I'll call again tomorrow. So she called the fifth time, the third day. And they still said it was impossible. That's still okay. She said, I'll call again. She called the sixth time that third day. And they still said it was impossible. The next day, she called the seventh time. They still said it was impossible. So she called the eighth time, and they did it. It's called persistence. <clears throat> and she came, it's a miracle God did it. And I'm rejoicing that I'll be in economy when I usually rejoice that I'm in business class. <laughs> I went to Manila, did the ministry. A few days later, checked in the flight. Sure enough, I'm confirmed in economy. I get on a plane. <clears throat> There's a lot of empty seats on this overbooked economy section. There's even two empty seats next to me. Supposedly overbooked, you know. I thought, well, that'll add to the quality of this story. <laughs> And two beautiful young Asian women come on the plane, indicate they're to sit next to me. And as the plane takes off, they both get out Bibles and begin to read. I said, oh, if I had my Bible study, I buy Bible, we could have a Bible study, couldn't we? And they thought that I was mocking them. Well, you know, older man flirting, come on, you understand. I said, no, 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 I'm a believer. My Bible's up there, I just can't prove it. Hello, my name is Paul, who are you? Well, my name is Meg. Oh, how long have you been a believer? Seven years. What do you do? I design women's clothes. I own two boutiques here in Manila. And she, without having any time to know anything about me, because I'm asking so many questions, she said to me, I am praying to lead all my employees to Jesus. And then she said, I've been reading the most exciting book. It's called, Is That Really You, God? Don't you know that book? I said, oh yeah, I work for the man that wrote it. <laughs> In fact, I'm in the book. <laughs> this is the Asian way of being humble. You close your eyes and put your... <laughs> she was so hungry for the next four hours, I private tutored her in how to recognize God's voice. As the plane landed in Seoul, I turned to her and said, if you'll give me your address, I will send you some teaching CDs because you're so hungry. So she did. And then she said, does your wife like pearls? And I said, well, yes. And I thought, well, why would she ask me that? And she put a small object in my hand, closed my hand, and says, a gift from God for your wife. Well, I thanked her while I'm trying to feel what it is. Of course, a small object in a cleansed fist is not easily identifiable. <clears throat> I could tell she didn't want me to look at it till I got off the airplane. So I complied with her request, thanked her again, got off the plane, opened my hand, and burst into high layers laughter. Because in my hand was a gold ring with a large pearl on it with six diamonds around the pearl. And why did I laugh? Because my wife, when she dropped me at the airport and her classic dry wit said, oh, by the way, honey, the next time you buy me a ring, I like pearl with diamonds. Oh. So when I came home, I said, here's the ring. 
<clears throat> so I said to the man, now you either have to believe me or call me a liar. And if you want, I'll take you home and we'll talk to my wife and she'll show you the ring. You should have seen him doing mental contortions to try to come up with a way to explain how this could happen without a God. Good luck. What am I saying to you? God wants you to witness so that you have something to testify to continuously about God acting engaged in your life. Now, I said to you, what does not make relationship with God possible? So we need to know, what does make relationship with God possible? Because God is a personal God. Now, if God is, if we are spirit, we are spiritual. So if you're personal, what are you? A person. Oh, that's simple. God is a personal God because God is a person. Does that bother you when I say that? Is God a people? No. What's a people? Those are persons living in physical bodies. God is spirit. He doesn't need a physical body. Okay? We're made in his image. We are spirit. We are spiritual. We are personal, so we are person. Personal relationship is possible between persons. Can you have a personal relationship with a dog? If you're a dog lover, you want to believe yes. <clears throat> but actually, a dog is not a person. You can only have some kind of a personal canine relationship with a dog. But it's not an interpersonal relationship. Okay? Personal relationship is possible between persons. So I believe in biblical personalism... That God is a person as we understand person. This is not without theological controversy. There are those who would disagree with that. But tell me, would Jesus die to restore a relationship that is not a real relationship? No. I don't think so either. So that leads me to conclude that God is person as we understand persons. Now you've got a definition. God is personal because God is person. It is one of the most foundational truths of Christianity. All right? <clears throat> Tozer. We can know the right world, words, yet never be changed. This is the difference between information and transformation. I hope you go away starting to ask yourself questions. What does that mean? Whenever you talk about God and you have words, you have all kinds of words. I was preaching in a large church in Eugene, Oregon several years ago. And I preached for 45 minutes on some things about who God is. The president of this local church's denomination for the whole world was in the meeting. I've known him for years. He's a man of God and a man of prayer. He said to me after the sermon, I hear hundreds of sermons every year, but I cannot remember the last time I heard a sermon about God. Yeah. Just take, take a minute, think. In your home church or other churches, can you remember a sermon where you are being taught about who God is? If, it is, if you are hearing, then you'd be grateful because it is very, very unusual. Because we have a lot of words, it is presumed we understand and we know, but we don't understand and we know very little, actually. Because knowing the words and being able to use it properly in a sentence does not mean that we understand what it really means. And the implications for how we live our life are the result of understanding what it means. <clears throat> this is not just my personal opinion. Here's the definition of personal from a normal dictionary. Look at notice. Relating to or affecting the person. There it is. All right. Look at this. This is from Christianity Today. A very, 
a highly respected conservative Christian magazine started by the Billy Graham organization, which of course means it has to be really good. Look at this. 13% Christians who attend evangelical churches who say God is more of an impersonal force than a person with whom people can have a relationship. If it said 13% of Christians, that wouldn't bother me. But when it says 13% of people who attend evangelical churches, that really bothers me. Because in America, an evangelical church is a church where people believe they need to be born again to enter into a relationship with Jesus. And yet, 13 out of 100 say, no, God's more of a force than a person with whom you can have a relationship. That is scary. <clears throat> Another survey done. Okay? The Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. 58% agree of those surveyed. Small percentage don't know and then disagree. The Holy Spirit is less divine than God the Father and Jesus. Well, that's a little better. Okay. Why did Benny Hinn, several years ago, write a book called Good Morning, Holy Spirit? Because he was, he was reinforcing the concept that the Holy Spirit is personal as the Father is personal and Jesus is personal. God can be known in, in intimate degrees of intimate acquaintance as we prepare our hearts for the wonder. Tozer wrote that in the 40s. He was way ahead of his time. Because the Bible is filled with intimate language about relationship with God. All right. Oswald Chambers. The root of faith is the knowledge of a person. Do you ever sing this hymn in church? Look what you sang. God in three persons. I've had people want to argue with me that God's personal and they've been singing this church this in their, in their service for generations and never questioned it. So either they weren't paying attention to what they were singing or they just never thought about it. Okay. <clears throat> so, are you convinced? It's not without... There's people in the church, there's the whole denominations that don't accept what I'm telling you. They would deny it. John Calvin, the highest proof of scriptures derives in general from the fact that God in person speaks in it. Hmm. Calvin. Okay. So Tozer says, we have almost forgotten that God is a person. And the deep of his mighty nature, he thinks, wills, enjoys, feels, loves, desires, and suffers as any other person may. God is a person and can be known in increasing degrees of intimate acquaintance as we prepare our hearts for the wonder. The Christian creed requires him to believe in the personality of God and we've been taught to pray our Father. Now personality and fatherhood carry with them the idea of the possibility a personal acquaintance. This is admitted, I say, in theory, but for millions of Christians, nevertheless, God is no more real than he is to the non-Christian. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. For this reason, the gravest, the most serious question before the church is always God himself. And the most important fact about you or me is not what we might say or do, but what in our deep heart we conceive God to be like. Wow. Now, if you went looking for this quote in those two books, you'd have to search because I pulled powerful sentences out and put them together in one paragraph. That's why it's almost a choke on it so, so much there. It's a big hunk of meat all at once. He spread it out with a lot of 
mashed potatoes in between bites of meat. <clears throat> but I put it all together. Okay? You know what? <clears throat> I've done all over the world sometimes. Because I, I lecture this in Why Women are Discipleship Training Schools all over the world. And sometimes I'll put the chart up there and I'll say, give me words that describe God. They will fill up the second column. They'll fill up the third column. They'll fill up the fourth column. I even have to create a fifth column. But nobody can ever think about what goes in the first column. Now, you've already saw that I put spirit in the first column and I put personal in the first column. Do you know what? In 45 years all over the world, in over 60 nations, nobody, when I ask a question, give me words to describe God, has ever said God is spirit. They know it, but they never think to say it. And they've never ever said God's personal. And most of them know it, but it doesn't come into their minds. I prove that what told you said is right. We've almost forgotten God's a person. And yet it's one of the most foundational truths in Christianity. Is God unique? Yes. Yeah. What? Is he very unique? Yes. No. Not even God's very unique. Don't fall into that trap. <laughs> you hear people in ignorance on television all the time. Try to, oh, that's very unique. You can't have degrees of uniqueness. You're either unique or you're not. <laughs> not even God can be very unique, so don't fall into that trap. Okay? What makes God unique? Well, he's the only true living God. Oh, yeah. That's right. But for the sake of discussion, if you're willing, we're going to lay aside the fact he's the only true living God, and we're going to list him with all the gods that people have ever tried to invent. Is he still unique? What makes him unique? No, the Greek gods were personal. Some people said babies by those gods. That's very personal. We, we set that aside. He's the only true living God. You can't say he died because that, he couldn't die if he wasn't living. So we, we set that aside. You agreed to that. I said, we put beside these the fact he's the only true living God. Do, we're going to accept their definition of their God for the sake of discussion. Is he still unique? And you all said yes, but now I want to know why. Don't you dare tell Muslim that Allah is not loving by their definition. Is he unique because he's infinite? No, because by definition, Allah is infinite. Is he unique because he's personal? No, because the Greek gods were personal by definition. What about, I, they always say, um, they don't know where he, they can't find where he, he's, uh, his bones and all that. People say that too. They say you can see where Buddha died and all that, but they say... Well, we can't even talk about the living dead part because we laid that aside for our discussion. Okay? You agree to it, so I'm holding you to it. Okay. I carry a God in my pocket. <laughs> this is an impersonal, finite God. By definition, a law is infinite, but impersonal. You never hear Muslim talk about relationship with God, with Allah, except a very small minority denomination of Islam called the Sufis, who believe in a personal Allah. But they're a very minute minority. I have an Indonesian friend who's a Sufi. And they're looking for a relationship with Allah. But they got that from biblical Christianity. <laughs> by definition, Allah was impersonal. The Greek gods, by definition, were personal, but they are finite. Lauren Cunningham, the founder of Wabam, says he's made this statement on university campuses all over the world and it's never once been challenged that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the only personal and infinite God people have ever tried to imagine. There are infinite gods, by definition, who are impersonal. There are personal gods that are finite, but there's only one God who's both personal and infinite. Infinite yet personal, personal yet infinite. If you understand what I'm saying, your heart should be going, yes! Why? Because it's evidence that demands a verdict. And it's so foundational for us as biblical Christians. So you understand my shock 
went all over the world all these years, I've asked what does it mean, and I get blank stares back when it's so foundational. And Tozer was right. We've almost forgotten God is a person. Now, we don't just need to accept other people's... We're going to prove it biblically, all right? So we're going to identify what the elements of being a person are, and then we're going to go in the scriptures and see, does God meet the qualifications? Now, you already know ahead of time we're going to discover, yeah, or we wouldn't go down that road, but we're going to discover, yeah, he meets the qualifications. He is a personal God with whom you can have a relationship. So what we're doing is we're laying a foundation biblically so you have something to stand on out of knowledge that that relationship can be a real relationship with the creator of the universe. Did you ever try to imagine how big God is and you short-circuited? Here's what you should do. You start with God and come down to yourself. And you know what you discover? You are a speck on a speck on a speck in the universe. And he even knows how many hairs in your head. You know what? All I have to hear God say to me to know that I'm valuable is, Paul, shut up. Because it means he knows I'm there. If that's all I hear, I know how I'm, he, he knows I'm there. He's back. And he, I'm valuable to him. Just If he just says, shut up. That's mind-boggling. When you think about it. Now, the word person or personal does not appear in the text of the scriptures in the English Bible. So how come we believe it? Because when you look at the full counsel of the word of God, you see that he meets the conditions for being person. But, you know, we have the English Amplified Bible. Perhaps some of you use it for study or read it. Okay? You know how you can look up a word in a dictionary and it amplifies your understanding of how that word can be used? Well, that's what the Amplified Bible does. In the brackets, they amplify what the, pre, what the, the, the preceding word was, it was implied there. So you have broader understanding. So what I did is I went through the entire Amplified Bible and I pulled out every time where the word person or personal was used in reference to God. Now, unless you use an Amplified Bible, don't bother to write the scriptures down because in your Bible it won't, it won't be there. Only in the Amplified Bible. But look at this. By means of the personal agency of the Holy Spirit, in the person of the Lord, a dependence upon his person. God is only one person. The wonders of his person. In the person of Jesus Christ. In his person. My actively present person. And one theologian who wrote a fantastic book called Narratives of a Vulnerable God in trying to explain the Trinity, which we know is a mystery. We don't really, we believe it, but we don't really understand how it functions. He writes, God exists three personhoodly. Is that even a word? <laughs> but none of these three persons has independent existence, for they are what they are in relation, so that God is what God is in this interrelation. Don't try to understand it. Okay? Just get the point. Okay? God exists three personhoodly. <laughs> okay? Um, I, I'm sorry, this is a video or an audio that just doesn't work on PowerPoint for some reason. But you know the word Elohim? You know the Hebrew language is a pictorial language? And each of the letters uh, have pictorial significance. And when you look at the pictures that represents Elohim, uh, the word for God in Hebrew... It, it identifies the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the pictures. I mean, it's, it's not just in Genesis where it says, let us make man in our image, but the very word Elohim, which is a plural, the pictures represent the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the pictures of the language. And that's what they explained here, but it doesn't, it, it won't, I can't get it to work, all right? So, 
what we understand is that persons think, persons feel, and persons make choices or has a will. So, if we can go and prove that God thinks biblically, that biblically God feels, and that biblically God has a will or makes choices, then we have the evidence that God meets the qualifications to being personal. Like we understand ourselves as being personal. So we'd have the biblical evidence. So when we return tomorrow, that's what we're going to do. We'll walk through this. And as we walk through it, you will start to see some of the implications. This is not just words to fill your notebook. But there will be implications to some of these, the ideas these words communicate that affect the way we should be living our life. So that the whole thing of God being a personal God is not just a theological statement. And not just that we can have a relationship with Him, but every aspect of His person has implications for us. And how we live our life. And how we're to function. We look at how God functions in His person, and then we learn how we're to function in our person. Because he's the model. He's our example. He doesn't live by his feelings, folks. He lives by his choices. Does God always feel good about you? He doesn't always feel good about me. <laughs> I, I disappoint him sometimes. I frustrate him sometimes. I anger him sometimes. But he doesn't stop loving me. He doesn't live by his feelings. Because if he did, we wouldn't be here. We'd have been wiped out a long time ago and we would have deserved it. But he doesn't live by his feelings. See, your feelings are real, but they're not always the truth. What's this generation? This is a generation that wants to feel. It's a postmodern generation. We'll cover that a little later in the weekend, explain to you what postmodernism is and the implications. And many of our politicians, important, including our former president, most recent former president, was a postmodernist. And that's why one day he says one thing and the next day he says exactly the opposite in a different, because whatever he wants to be true today is true. Because that's how he feels. He was epitome of postmodernist worldview, of postmodernist thinking. And that's why he got so many Pinocchio awards. You know, there's a newspaper in the East Coast that awards Pinocchio awards to politicians. <laughs> What happened to Pinocchio's nose when he lied? And Mr. Obama several times got five Pinocchios. <laughs> Many times. Okay. You know what? I don't want to go any further tonight because this will just introduce and we'll not get very far. Okay. We're finishing this a little bit early. Do you have any questions from tonight? If your question relates to tomorrow, I'll tell you, I'll get that tomorrow. Yes, sir. Okay, so when you were talking about uh, spiritual languages, I've often really been confused where I went, because I was baptized in the Pentecostal church. Uh -huh. um, so when I received the Holy Spirit, I spoke in those times. Yeah. Uh, but I, in my mind, didn't know what was going on, so yeah. I shut my mouth, and I literally felt the receiving of the Spirit. Yeah. Uh, and it took me two years after devotion and, and, and just seeking the Lord, mm -hmm. and the elders had to anoint me with oil, and I received my prayer language again. Yeah. How do you describe that to someone who doesn't really understand it? Well... It's because it's, 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 it's by the spirit. It's pure spirit. It bypasses the intellect. So when you shut it down because you don't understand it, you quench the Holy Spirit. That, or grieve the Holy Spirit. I, whenever we do a big evangelism outreach, um, like in Atlanta, 96, we had 5,000 people come to do evangelism. Well, in that kind of a big evangelistic outreach where people come to do evangelism, they get homesick, they get physically sick. They want to go home about halfway through. So we know about halfway through that kind of an evangelism outreach, we have a meeting where people can come forward for prayer. 
So we were doing that in Atlanta in 96. And there was about 200 people who wanted prayer. And I just prayed for this person. And clear across the room of 200 people being prayed for by another 100 people, I saw this young man, which I just know I need to pray for him. So I went over and I said, can I pray for you in, in good English? He said, yes. I put my hand on his belly, but English didn't come out. An unknown tongue came out. And in 30 seconds of praying that way, he got my hand completely wet with his tears. And when I, asked, when I finished, he said, do you realize that you've been speaking to me in Portuguese? He said, I'm from Brazil. I said, well, what was I saying? He said, oh, you were confirming everything God has told, been telling me, and that's why I cried so much. And I thought, well, I know what Portuguese feels like. I've been to Brazil. It's a mushy language. The word intercession in Portuguese is intercessão. That's mushy. Sao. <laughs> so he heard Portuguese. I didn't pray Portuguese. Five years later, I'm in Hawaii, and uh, I'm walking at the university campus, and here's a Brazilian woman Hey, Paul, toot the bane. Uh, you know, that means really good. How you doing? Uh, toot the bane. And she said, prayed any Portuguese lately? I said, what? She said, oh, in Atlanta five years ago, I heard you praying for that Brazilian guy in Portuguese. Oh, I guess I did pray in Portuguese because two people heard it. So I didn't understand anything. But when you, it, in your case, you were, you were grieving the Holy Spirit, so he didn't want to violate your will, so he just backed off. But whenever you quench the Holy Spirit, you may have to wrestle to get what you lost so that you value it. So, I can tell you many stories. We had a team in Central Asia. They were talking, trying to talk to an old man in a village square, where the, the, the well for the village was, and they weren't, he didn't understand any English. So they just decided to speak to him in an unknown tongue, and he started talking back to them. Of course, they didn't understand what he said. They carried on a conversation. And then the man left. And it wasn't five minutes, and his son came back and said, um, um, how do you know our village native tongue? And they said, well... You, you, my father told me you've been speaking to him in our, in our local dialect. How do you know it? And they said, well, what have we been saying? Oh, you've been telling him that you're bringing a Christian university here to our country. <laughs> well, well, my mom has an international university. And they didn't know. They just carried on a conversation with the guy because they just let the spirit flow through them what they did not understand with their intellect. So you can allow God to do that if you're willing and he'll do some supernatural things because his heart is for people and he'll do everything he can to get through to them any way he can. Would you say that tongues is like they always have said, mainly in the Pentecostal uh, theology, that it is the evidence? It's not the only... They, used to, they always taught it's the only initial evidence, but I disagree with that. No. You see, at the beginning of the Pentecostal movement... A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination, Tozer's denomination, they seriously considered joining together. But because the Pentecostals are hard-nosed about the only initial evidence of speaking in tongues, and Simpson couldn't accept that, that they didn't unite. CMA needed the experience of the Holy Spirit, but the Pentecostals needed the biblical foundation that CMA would have given them. And the history of the church would have been very different in this day had that unification taken place. But because the Pentecostals were so hard-nosed. The reason they were hard-nosed about it is because they had, been, they had grown up in denominational, historical denominations and felt they'd been lied to. And so they, they rejected education. It wasn't just because they were poor people who weren't educated. It's that the leaders rejected education. Because they went too far with experience without the foundation of the Word of God. My, my son studied at Indiana Wesleyan University in political science. And his professor, Dr. Glenn Martin, used to say, a commitment to intellectual content without an equivalent commitment to experiential practice leads to an immobilizing scholasticism. I'll translate in a minute. 
And then he said, but an equivalent, a commitment to experiential practice without an equivalent commitment to intellectual content leads to mysticism. See, there's two extremes in the body of Christ. This extreme over here looks at that over there and says, those poor people, they don't have a systematic theology. They don't Greek and Hebrew, which in many cases they didn't. But this group looks at that group over there and goes, they don't even know when they got saved, which is frequently true. But you need the balance of the two. The word is intellectual content. Prayer and worship is experiential practice. You need the balance of both. Otherwise, you're out of balance. So, you know, so you have to look across the, uh, the, the divide and find somebody that's on the other side of the divide and say, we need each other. That's been the strength of you for the mission because we are many denominations, mm -hmm. many nationalities, many languages, and we're as strong as our collective strength. Of course, we're bound together by our weakness, but we're as strong as our collective strength. Because every denomination has strengths. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite different from Reformed theology, but I, when I lecture on education, I quote a lot of, of Reformed educators because they have a lot to say about Christian education that is valuable and significant. Um... And so I quote them, like uh, Rusus Rushduni and um, the guy from Westminster Seminary. Sproul's Jew person. I know Sproul, yeah. yeah. I don't know the person name. He's with Jesus now, but yeah. yeah. And uh, so we can have theological differences but still be friends. But Tozer was really big. He said, the biggest divide in the church is not between the theological liberal and the theological fundamentalist. The biggest divide in the church is between the evangelical rationalist and the evangelical mystic. He called himself a mystic. If you look up mystical in a dictionary, one of its definitions is a person who believes that their God speaks to them and they speak back to him. That if you hear God, if God speaks to you and you give testimony, then you're mystical. You're mystical. And Tozer called himself mystical, but he had a very strong biblical foundation <clears throat> because the experience has to be tested with the Word, but the Word will lead you to experience. Do you know who Richard Foster is? He was made famous by his book called Celebration of Discipline. Well, he's written a fantastic book on prayer. It's called Prayer, Find the Heart's True Home. He's a Quaker by theological association and denomination. But in the book, he explains how God taught him several things through prayer contrary to his Quaker doctrine. But when he went back in the scriptures, he found the evidence of, it, of what God taught him in prayer in the scriptures. They just didn't see it before based on their tradition. <coughs> so, if you, if, you know, what were the Berean Christians? Why were they commended? Because whatever they were heard, they went and confirmed it in the scriptures. Have you ever had your pastor preach and say things he didn't prove? And you went home and you researched everything he said, not because you questioned him, but because you needed for yourself that it was the word. My pastor preached a sermon. I spent two weeks one time researching every single thing he said that he didn't prove in the scriptures. Because of what I believe God was saying to me from the message, and I had to know that it would line up with the Word of God, and it did. But it took me two weeks of study to come to that conclusion. But most of us, we just, it goes in one ear, not the other. We don't do anything. With it. I don't want you to leave this weekend and have it go in one ear, not the other. I want you to be challenged so that change can come. And that's exciting. Okay, let's go. Thank you, Lord, for our time together tonight. I ask that you would give us a good night's rest. I ask that tomorrow would be an uneventful day for all of us, whether it's school or work or with the kids or whatever it is, so that we can return tomorrow night for the second phase of, of talking about you and, getting, and, and being challenged to get to know you better. We ask, Lord, for those who couldn't come tonight, that you will also free up their schedules so that they'll be uninhibited and be able to come tonight. And then we also... Ask that in preparation for, for our day on Saturday to do. In Jesus' name, amen.